Here we go. Spoiler alert, audience. Look at the people today. Mr. Russo Day. Welcome. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the show. It's a big day. Fancy day. Anthony Russo. Thank you, everybody. Have a seat. Let's get started. Yes. Thank you. Hi. Have a seat, everybody. Let's get started. So. We are very excited for today's show. We are very excited for today's show. I'll tell you why in just a second, but keep that love going. Right over there for my sister from another mister. It's Kendall, everybody. Hello. Good morning. How you doing? I'm doing good. Why are you doing why are you doing good today? Because I had a great breakfast. Oh. Did you did you have a good breakfast this morning? I did, Jace, and it wasn't a scone, it was a biscuit. No, so I talk about them all the time, audience, <laughs> and I've made them on the show. Uh, you know, my uh, my dad's family is all uh, from the South, from Cumberland, Kentucky, Tennessee, my dad's family is. And you know, if you live in the South, one of the things you have to make well are biscuits. And uh, yeah, you have to. So my, my grandpa, you know, in the South, he called him Papa and Mama. Uh, my Papa, I learned how to make his buttermilk. I would watch him make biscuits my entire life. And, uh, I, I, you know, I lost them uh, many years ago. And the only thing I wanted was all of his cookware. So over the years, I have perfected Papa's uh, biscuit recipe. So I, so, so I have, girl, I have girls night every Tuesday where I get together with my friends, my best friend, Jen, and uh, my fancy friend, Lisa LaCourcier. And uh, so they, they, came to, they came to my house last night and I baked like 80 versions of biscuits. Uh, yeah, yeah. So this is my, this is the, this is one of them. This is my, this is my original. Look at that girl right there, yeah. So, that's my, yeah. And so Kendall came in today looking, came into my radio room looking for coffee and food. Oh. So uh, how, I, I gave you my, the lemon blueberry biscuit that I make. Mm -hmm. how, how was it? Oh my gosh, it was honestly like crack. <laughs> I, like, <laughs> I just wanted to keep eating it and eating it. It was, I, I was like, oh, Jason makes a lot of biscuits. I know that they're good, but whatever. Yeah. I ate it and I honestly was like, holy cow, he made this? Yes. It was so so good. Thank I you. like I shoveled it down my throat real fast. Yep, I make yeah from from scratch, girl, from scratch. Oh, Ain't no so mix here. Yeah. Yeah, I for I didn't have coffee this morning here. They didn't have any in the cafe, and they didn't have any in my house. So I text Jason frantically at 4:45. Jace, I need coffee. I need coffee. I need, I need coffee. coffee. I need coffee. I need coffee. So it's an existential crisis. Yeah. So and, I saved you. Yeah. I have a coffee machine yep. in my radio studio. So I, I my call my George Clooney coffee machine. So <laughs> I, I I fired it up and. Got you breakfast this morning. Well, I'm glad yep. you like them. So yeah, and it, people always ask, and we're gonna get emails today. What's the recipe? Here's the deal. I'll, I'll just tell you quickly before we get to the hot dish. The truth of the matter is, most biscuit recipes are rather pedestrian. It's all about the same. Uh, it's flour. It's butter. It's buttermilk. Salt. Sugar. Done. It's all about the technique. Really, is the secret. It's really it is a science. You just have to make sure. This is why I tell everyone when they ask me. You just have to make sure all the ingredients are cold, and I mean cold. The butter has to be cold. The milk has to be ice cold and don't overwork the dough. If you do those two things, you'll be fine. If you overwork the dough, they'll be flat like this. I mean, that's what your biscuits will look like. So there we go. This has been cooking with Jason. There we go. Okay. Speaking of cooking, speaking of cooking, everybody, let's get started. It's time for the hot dish. Here we go. So it's fun today because the audience is great today. And also, yeah. We have probably one of the biggest guests we've had on in years. He's, yeah. Have you heard of a very small movie called Avengers Endgame? Yeah. The director is here. One of the co-directors, Anthony Russo. Yeah. And 
And the reason I brought this whole thing up is executive producer Jeff is gone. He's in Vegas. So producer Ted is in the studio today. I love this. Yeah. Okay. Let's get started. Henry Winkler was on Kimmel last night and Henry talked, you know, the Fonz, hey, and talked about a moment on the set of Happy Days when he was handed a phone call. Someone goes here from a police officer who had said, listen to this, who said he had a 17 year old boy threatening to jump off a building unless he could talk to Henry. What? Let's pick up the story. Look at this. I don't know where I got the nerve to take the phone and start talking to this kid. I said, okay, what is your name? Uh, John, John, okay. Uh, jo how old are you, John? 17, you're 17, you're on the ledge, you're, you wanna, why, why do you wanna jump, John? Uh, I wanna be an actor. So you're 17, you haven't made it yet. Okay, let me ask you a question. Do you collect records? Do you have a record collection? Because at that time they were vinyl. Sure. I said, do you have a record collection? He said, yes. I said, okay, so before you jump, John, will you just um, will them to me? <laughs> okay, good, good. good. Do, do me a favor. If you get off the ledge, we'll, let's talk about acting. Okay? All right. Oh, yeah. Hand the phone. Yeah, okay. All right. You're inside now? Okay. I was 27 when I got the Fonz, John. I think you've got 10 good years to keep trying. How about that? Will you do that? Okay, can I get back to rehearsing? Thank you. Wow. Yeah. And the teen was fine. The teen was fine. Now, he said, Henry said he's never heard uh, back from the teen again, but reports were that the teen was fine and he got off, uh, got off the roof or wherever he was wow. because of the Fonz. Yeah. That would be, I don't, I don't know what you would do in that situation. I mean, I probably wouldn't be as calm as and as a cucumber as the Fonz was. No, I mean, you know what I mean. No, no, I, that's terrifying. I love Henry Winkler. He's one of those that everybody that I've ever met, that, and I've met him once. He did. They just said he's the nicest guy. He's just a kind, kind man. Yes, yeah. Sid met him. He was on one of her flights, and oh, really? she said that he was just awesome. He's a delight. Yeah. He's mm -hmm. he's one of those that appreciates the role he was given. He doesn't shy away from the Fonz. He realizes that the Fonz gave him his career, and he really mm -hmm. did, until he jumped over that shark, and that was, you know, anyway, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Next in the dish, thank the audience. It took him two seconds to get that. It was just a, just a second. Yeah, yeah, it's all right. For all the youngins out there, the term jump the shark when something's done came from happy days, just yeah. FYI, yeah. Next in the dish, you guys are going to love this. Oprah and Gail are out with a new installment of their OG Chronicles, uh, which is a series on YouTube. This time, Oprah and Gail are trying to stay hip, okay, by trying to figure out the definition of new slang words. Look at this. Jomo. Mm. I can honestly say I've never heard that phrase, Jomo. Because I know fear of missing out. For FOMO. Yes, you have so, that a lot. Yeah, yeah yes. it's true, I do. Yeah, I don't like are, to miss nothing. You are a F big FOMO. JOMO, or... what could the J stand for? Jo um, JOMO. Well, fear of missing out is FOMO. So JOMO means I want to miss out. <laughs> oh, joy. Okay, that's oh, a new I, one. Oh, that should be mine. <laughs> okay, yeah. <laughs> Very you have jo JOMO all the I time. I must have, I, I have JOMO I all the time. I am definitely did not. FOMO. She's she FOMO. is I'm definitely JOMO. JOMO. Oh my God, that's my we new favorite. We learned something new. That's good, JOMO. My I'm new favorite term. <laughs> JOMO, that's right. Other, other words they had trouble with, snack. The, I, I, I've heard the snack which means uh, looking good, you know, mm -hmm. someone looking good. Like, oh, they're just a little snack over there. That's right. Wig snatched. Oh. Wig snatched to express surprise or call something beautiful. You know, and now see, I, I'm like Oprah. I watched that. Oprah thought that was something negative. I would have thought that wig snatch is something negative. It is not. It means like, you're beautiful. Kendall, you are wig snatched. I don't even know what I mean, which sounds, You, darling. It couldn't sound more ridiculous coming out of my mouth. You're I apologize. Just a, you're yeah. just a snack, Chase. I, I, you're just yeah. a snack. Yeah, I'm a 45 year old man who just said wig snatched. <laughs> yeah, anyway, <laughs> let's move on. Next in the dish, a blast from the past. CBS and Viacom are on the verge of rekindling their love affair. 
Now you're wondering, like, Jace, what is this, business news? No, this affects you. Here's the deal. The two companies split back in 05, but are ready to rejoin. They're getting back together. They're remarrying. The decision, here's the dealio. The, the decision is going to the, the, to combine will allow CBS to compete with companies like Warner, because, uh, you know, they own HBO and they have all that stuff. NBC Universal, when they combine, and Disney, which owns everything. Uh, yeah, as well as streaming giants like Amazon and Netflix. Viacom owns brands like Showtime, they own Nickelodeon, they own MTV, BET, Comedy Central, and the Paramount Network, and it will give CBS access to 140,000 TV episodes and 3,600 movies like the Transformers franchise. They're going to get that. They're going to now own the Star Trek franchise. So, and the, the big deal, the reason this affects all of us is because now it, they're going to beef up their streaming service called CBS All Access. Mm -hmm. Because if I were them, and look, this isn't good for us, this part, but if I were them, I would take all of that content and put it all on that streaming app. Because that's literally in 10 years, that's what this is all going to be. We're all going to be on streaming apps. So if I, if, once they do this, put right. everything they have on CBS All Access. Well, and they have like Kung Fu Panda, all yep. the Mission Impossible. They've got, uh, what's the other one that's really big that they have? And what, uh, Indiana Jones? Yeah, that's they've a got Paramount. that one. Yeah. I mean, they've got so much stuff that you don't even think about that yep. you're like, oh, wow. And that's the thing, content. Everybody wants to own as much content. Uh, speaking of content, we have about 43 more minutes of content when we come back, back after this. <laughs> Coming up, this is big like Avengers Big. It's not every day the co-director of the biggest movie of all time is in the Jason Show studio. Our special guest today, Anthony Russo, will join us live to talk about Avengers Endgame and so much more. Then Disney Channel star Elle Winter will join us ahead of her event at the Mall of America. And if you won an Oscar, where would you keep it? Wait till you hear where Emma Thompson keeps hers. That's all coming up, so stay right there. RuPaul, you and I are nominated in the same category. <laughs> now, I should say, Ru, you have won the past three years, but a lot of people are saying this is my year. <laughs> what do you think? You have six, 16 nominations this year? Um, I don't want to go on about it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. The last thing I want is this interview to become about me. <laughs> no, no. But, Rue, we should look. <laughs> Rue, we should look who we're up against. We are up against, uh. you and I were up against Ellen, little newcomer, fresh out the yeah. box. Yeah, uh, I've heard of Amy her. Amy Poehler and Nick Offerman and Marie Kondo, who I think might be our biggest threat. Right, right. What do we do to prevent her from winning? <laughs> <laughs> Wow, Ru! RuPaul, <laughs> RuPaul on Corden last night talking about the primetime Emmys coming up in September. Uh, they'll air right here on the old FOX. Well, next in the dish, Henry Golding was on Fallon last night. He starred, if you don't, if the name isn't familiar, it, soon it will be, because he was in Crazy Rich Asians. And will co-star in the upcoming film, Last Christmas, which I can't believe we're already talking about Christmas movies. Thank you, audience. And again, Dear stores, it's not even Halloween yet. I just want to, I just, you know what I mean? I... Hold the phone, everybody. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, he's in the movie with Emma Thompson, one of our favorites, and talked about the time that he went to Emma Thompson's house and went searching for her Oscars. <laughs> Look at this. I'm kind of looking around, nowhere to be seen. I'm like, she must have locked them up. She must have, like, put them somewhere really secure. Is that a um, museum somewhere? In the mu exactly. And so... I, I start heading back to the, to the living room and the, the, the dining room, and uh, I thought, oh, I'll just go for a waz, and we'll, we'll just, a wee for, for every, okay. all the Americans out there. Okay. Um, a wee. Waz, okay. Uh, and so I'm, I'm, I'm sort of, I'm conducting business, and then suddenly my eyes just reach these two golden statues in the toilet, and they are the, you, the, the Oscars. You took a picture of I, Emma I Thompson's to. bathroom. <laughs> Look at this. I oh. had to. Look how amazing that is. <laughs> how cool. Wow. 
Well, you know, where, I guess where else would you keep an Oscar? I mean, maybe in your office? I don't know. Anyway, last Christmas hits theaters in November. Where would, if you won one, where would you keep it? Not on the toilet. Yeah, I, I, I know. I mean, but. I'd probably put it on the mantle. I'd be like, girl, look. Yeah, I know. I, I, look. I, somewhere where it would be prominently displayed. Right. And can I just say, like, Emma Thompson's toilet is surprisingly small and normal looking. Yeah. See? That's what people think. Like, what did you? Like her toilet, her bathroom. Oh. Like the whole thing. It just I'm looks like, very, like. A toilet is a toilet is a toilet. Well, I don't in know what Britain, you want. they call it a toilet, the loo. Okay. And but, I'm. British today. Yeah, I was going to say, I didn't know there were different. Okay, anyway, <laughs> next in the dish. Disney might be feeling some buyers. Disney might be feeling some buyers remorse after their $71 billion acquisition of 20th Century Fox, our old company. Uh, yeah, why? Well, Mickey Mouse is reportedly really mad, fuming with the movie studio, 20th Century Fox, after their first quarter produced meager results. Now, here's the deal. Disney CEO announced 20th Century Fox's quarterly earnings were well below what he had hoped that they would be. Some Hollywood insiders called the public reprimand a public hanging. Wow. Disney is not happy. Yeah. Disney is not happy with Fox's box office return so far this year with only one breakthrough. Uh, with only one. It's called Breakthrough Making Any Money. Other movies, X-Men, Dark Phoenix, uh, Stuber and The Art of Racing in the Rain were all giant flops. The Dark Phoenix lost the company $170 million. Now, here's the deal. To be fair, though, all of these movies came out as Disney films like The Lion King, Aladdin, and Avengers, hi, Mr. Russo, were breaking records. You know what I mean? And again, why Disney can't be mad. I don't know why they're mad. All of these films were well into production before they ever signed on the dotted line to buy the company. Mm -hmm. So this shouldn't A, be a surprise, and B, Mickey, you didn't have anything to do with these movies. Just, if you don't like what's coming up from 20th Century Fox, get them out, put them on the move, get them out, put them on the clearance rack, get them done, you know what I mean? Get them out there, or do them direct to video, and be done with it. I guess. Well, you said it, that they didn't really buy Fox, 20th, 21st Century Fox. They didn't really buy it just for these movies that are coming no. out right now. That they wasn't bought for the intention. The, and I got to tell you, I'm going to make a prediction that's very sad for anybody like us, like me, that loves movies. I have a feeling if this keeps going, I think Disney's going to get rid of 20th Century Fox altogether. I think they're going to get rid. They've been getting rid of their, a lot of their yeah, stuff. I think yeah. they're going to get rid of that mm -hmm. moniker, that company. I think everything will just be under them. I hope not, because right. when you think of Hollywood, you think of you, you think of the the fanfare. You know what I yeah. mean. You think of dun 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 dun. dun. You think mm -hmm. what I think of when I think I almost did the whole thing. But anyway, <laughs> I've worked for this company way too long. Yeah, so I, it was, we used to own it. Yeah. But what I mean by that is I'm very happy still working for this company. I just want to be very clear. That's right. <laughs> Or I'll be making biscuits for a living. That's right. Still ahead, everybody. More drama inside the Big Brother houses. 30 Minutes of Hot Dish continues. We'll tell you what showmance could be on the rocks. And then one of the directors of the highest grossing movies in histories in the house, Anthony Russo from Avengers Endgame, will join us in just a little bit. Back in a moment, everybody. Guys, don't forget too. Uh, two little notes. Well, I'll remind you the, uh, at the end of the show too. Uh, we're going to be live at the Minnesota State Fair every weekday except for Labor Day. So come see us. You don't need a ticket. You don't need to reserve a seat. You just need a ticket to the fair. Come see us. We're right next to the giant slide. And don't forget, uh, we're really excited because season five of our show debuts the day after Labor Day. So that's right, season five. New mugs. We will have all new mugs. The audience uh, loves our mugs. We have a new color this year. Yeah, so. And something else will be new too, and you will see what that is the day after Labor Day. Mm -hmm. He's not actually firing me. I uh, no, you're staying. You're going to be new, yeah. More <laughs> dish for you. There is some drama inside and outside the Big Brother house, and that means it's time for. Oh, 
No, she didn't. That's right. Drama horns on. Showmances. Here's the deal. Showmances are part of the game of Big Brother. The house guests live so close to each other. I mean, it can't help sometimes, but fall in love or have nookie or whatever, which means every season things can get a little hot and heavy. And this season, one of the steamiest showmances was between this dude named Nick and Bella. Things got really heated about a month ago. Look at this. I'm always worried if I love you. Yeah. Well, the thing is, is that what? I'm in love with you and that okay. I don't want you to be worried when you're out of here. Okay. So I figured it'd just be easier, even though I said I would wait. I really want you to be my girlfriend. <laughs> oh. He was holding her head weird, wasn't yeah. he? It was like, and like, uh, I, like I felt very uncomfortable with uh, that and the no shirt. And, his, and, and, and then his, his speech pad was, I really want you to be my girlfriend. <laughs> <laughs> am, I, am I alone on this? He was, no, it was creepy. It was very he was like, creepy. I really want you to be my girlfriend. I, I, yeah. Anyway, I, I'm talking to a plastic plant, but yeah. Nick professing his love to Bella. And the two started uh, going steady. I love that word. I haven't used that since 1987, but yeah. Going steady. I haven't, I haven't used that since I went steady with Bernice Corley. That's right, yeah. A while ago. That was my girlfriend. Yeah. Uh, don't laugh, audience. I had a girlfriend. Yeah, I did. Two weeks ago, though, she was voted out and sent home. Nick was devastated, but apparently time heals all wounds because Nick has a new cuddle buddy. And Bella, who is home watching, is not happy about it. No. Live feed cameras picked up footage of Nick snuggling Annalise. Is that, is that am I pronouncing her name right? Yeah. To which Bella said, maybe Nick, maybe Nick and I can discuss this once he is out of the house and go from there. She also said she can no longer support him in the game. No one deserves to feel second in a relationship. Yeah. Okay. Child. Okay. I, uh, you go first. I got I, the dish. Okay. I got the scoops. This Annalise girl is phenomenally beautiful. Like I Googled her and I was like, oh girl. Mm, okay. So that hurts. A. B. Nick bro has the weirdest Spock haircut I've ever seen. So I have no idea why she's hooking up with him on the show because in real life they'd never talk. Three. This Annalise girl dated the guy who got kicked off for all the racist comments he made. Yeah. So this is like a. Oh, I don't really? know. And, yeah. Okay. You were on three. That was Four. it. Four. Four. Who thinks that a love affair you get on Big Brother is going to last? <laughs> Let's, I mean, you know what I mean? I don't know. Come on. I don't know. Come on. I don't know. Anyway, next in the dish, another clip from Fallon. Y'all are going to like this. This is so sweet and cute. Jonathan Groff from Frozen told Jimmy that he records voice memos for kids. Because he plays, um, not, he doesn't play, who is the he? Olaf. Olaf. The he snowman. plays Olaf, yeah. Um, and he makes little voice memos for kids on the phone and then offered to make one for Jimmy's kids, Winnie and Franny. Look at this. Hi, Winnie and Franny. This is Kristoff from the movie Frozen, and I'm here with my friend Sven. Say hi, Sven. Hi, Winnie and Franny. It's me, Sven. And we wanted to sing a song for you. Isn't that right? That's right, Kristoff. Let's sing him a song. Okay, here we go. <clears throat> Reindeers are better than people. Sven, don't you think that's true? Yeah, people will beat you and curse you and cheat you. Every one of them's bad except you. Thanks, buddy. But Winnie and Franny smell better than reindeers. Sven, don't you think I'm right? That's once again true, because Winnie and Franny, we love you. Now tell Winnie and Franny good night. Good night. Don't let the frost bite. Bite. We love you, Winnie and Franny. <laughs> Dying. Yeah, I see, he plays Kristoff. I said, uh, dot, how sweet. I already love Jonathan Groff, and now I love him even more. Oh that is fantastic. God. Yeah. That was so cute. Like, my heart melted. I know. <laughs> Still ahead, everybody, the director of Avengers Endgame and Infinity War is here. We're chatting live in studio with Anthony Russo what it's like to make literally the biggest movie of all time. We'll ask him, but first. Former Disney star singer Elle Winter will join us live ahead of her performance at the Mall of America when The Jason Show continues right after this.
Well, she is an actress and singer who was discovered by Disney at the age of 13 when she competed on the next big thing. And later today, she's going to be performing a free concert at the Mall of America. She has a new single. That's right. She has a new single called Cave In. Look at this. Ladies and gentlemen, give it up for Elle Winter, everybody. Hi, Elle. Hi. Welcome. Hi, thank you so much. This is, we were talking in the break, this isn't your first time in Minnesota. You've actually, you performed right. at the Mall of America already. Yes, it's my second time performing at the Mall of America. Yeah. That is crazy. I'm so excited. It's such a great venue. I yeah, mean, it's a great venue. amazing crowd. And then you can just go shopping after. Exactly. And go on rides. And so. go see an aquarium if right. you want to. There's an aquarium? There's an aquarium now. Oh that's my right God. in the basement. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, so my first time I went to the amusement park. Yeah. And now I will hit up the aquarium. The aquarium. It's okay. a, one, um, underwater. No, that's what it used to be called. Sea Life. Sea Life, Minnesota. Thank okay. you. Okay. Yeah, amazing. it's really cool. It's in the basement. Oh, thank you. Is this something you've. I, I always. I'm inspired and I always love someone that kind of followed their dreams because, you you know, this is what I always wanted to do. Is singing something you always wanted to do, like when you were a kid? Yeah, I mean, I've always loved music. My mom says I was singing and talking at the same time. Yeah. And I would watch artists I love, like Britney Spears and Christina Aguilera, and these powerful young women pursuing it easily. And I just thought this was the path for me. It seemed so simple. Like, yeah. that's what I can do. If these women can do it, I can do it too. What was your first step? What was like the first professional thing that you did? Yeah, so I started taking vocal lessons actually at age four. Um, four? Yeah, I was singing Out Tonight from Rent. And I had no idea what I was like, what it I, was eating, I was eating animal crackers and she's singing Rent. Yeah. Yeah, but I, um, I then took part in an acting course when I was seven in New York City. And an agent came to the final showcase and I signed with them and started doing work in New York and kind of took off from there. It's crazy. Did you... And what is it like now? Because, you know, you mentioned Brittany and Christina. Where do you, what's it like um, now with social media being, mm -hmm. I always think of young stars now because it's just so different. I mean, you, not only do you have to do your career, but you also have to kind of give yourself to the fans in a way, in a way that Brittany and Christina didn't at the beginning of the career. Is that a hard balance for you? Right, I think it is. It's just interesting because I find that music is a way you can let people in and be vulnerable and be honest and share those experiences. But now you have social media as an outlet to do that as well. So I just think it adds, I mean, people love listening to their favorite artists to get to know them. And now it's just another another way to get to know them as well. And you co-write you co all of your music, right? Yes. I so love that. Thank you I, so much. Where do you get your, everyone does it different, everyone has a different process. Where do you find it's the easiest for you to write music? I, you know, I write everywhere. Like sometimes on the airplane, I'm very inspired. I'm yeah. always writing on my phone. I'll go to a party, something happens, I write it down. Um, do you write it, do you write it immediately? Oh, totally. The I'm in my notes, like in the corner writing. People Seriously. think I'm texting, I'm writing about them, yeah. Do you hear, okay, because the, the process, do you hear the melody first or do you hear what usually comes to you first? Right. If I'm in a recording studio and writing there, I'm usually starting with melodies just because there's so much music surrounding me. Yeah. But when I'm at an event or somewhere and in, in a situation that's inspiring me, the lyrics definitely come first. The lyrics come yeah. first, yeah. yeah. I'm fascinated by the process. No, it's Do you really like songwriting? Do you enjoy it? I love it. I mean, I think it's it's so fulfilling to sing songs that are meaningful and tell your own stories and connect with other people. I think that's what music is really all about. Well, you are connecting because let me just say this. 65 audience, 65,000 monthly listeners on Spotify. Woo! Your latest single, <laughs> Do You, has clocked in at 160,000 streams. Woo! And... Well, I'm not done. Uh, you're on Netflix in an original comedy, and you're, wait, I'm sorry, and you were in a movie with Susan Sarandon, Elle Fanning, and Naomi Watts. Not bad, Elle. Thank you. So, the, you start off as the little girl who took voice lessons at four, and then take me to the first day you're on the set with Naomi and Susan Sarandon. Yeah. Is there a moment where you kind of look around and go, what? Like, how did I get here? Yeah, I mean, it's it's definitely surreal. 
um, you know, having a dream and then actually pursuing it like yes. that. But um, I mean, I've been I've been doing it for a long time, so it kind of seems like those achievements that are just yeah. like it's a progression that seems you well, know natural. Congratulations Thank again. You. As I said, I, I'll end how I began. I admire anybody that uh, has a dream, follows it. You didn't just pursue it, you've done it. So congratulations to you. Elle Winter, everybody. As I said, you can find her on Spotify, YouTube, and Instagram. Just search for Elle Winter. And again, you can see her and Max perform live at the Mall of America at 3 p.m. today. We'll be right back in just a few minutes. Thank you so much. Thank you for being here. I'm a hugger. Thank you. Wow. Big deal. Welcome back. Our next guest. Now they're oh very good. The audience has been stunned into silence for an hour because of our next guest. He, along with his brother, directed two of the top five grossing movies of all time, including number one on that list. A little independent film called Avengers Endgame, which has made, which has made nearly, and just take this number in for a second, has made nearly 2.8 billion dollars worldwide. Look at this. That is a clip from Avengers Endgame, which is now available. It's now available on Blu-ray and streaming as well. Give it up for the director of that movie and Infinity War, Mr. Anthony Russo, everybody. Let me move this flower. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank, Thank you. you. Sincerely, I, I read a tease for this show. I did the tease yesterday, and I'm like, hey, come on. And I said your name, and a woman in the second row passed out. She couldn't believe oh, that no. she was at the wrong show. Oh, no. When you hear people, I'm not the first one to introduce you, or you're, I'm not the first person to say the words, you were the co-director of the biggest, most successful movie of all time. Can you wrap your brain around that? No. No, it's, I mean, it sounds surreal, and... Uh... I just kind of, I think I kind of block it out. I think my brother and I both kind of block it out. Yeah. Because, I mean, look, we, we love, we're so proud of the movie. We're so happy with it. And the fact that it's being embraced is like, it, that's what means everything. Well, I was going to say, uh, there's one thing, because it is your baby, your babies, and you put so much effort into it. So you have the self-satisfaction of like, hey, I like it. I'm happy with this. But it must be a great gift for you after the reviews started coming in, and not only were the critics loving it, but the fans were loving it, what does that feel like as, as a creative? It, it, look, it means everything. You know, certainly making a movie, you know, according to your own barometer and your own mm. taste and your own instincts is the most important thing, and we, we did that. But uh, unless it reaches an audience, you haven't kind of completed the, the process of making a film because film is expensive, film is difficult. It requires a lot of people and a lot of money to create a film. A lot of money in this case. A lot of That's money. right, yeah. <laughs> so you gotta. So until you've landed it with audiences, you really haven't completed the effort. I was gonna say, I mean, when you see the sheet or when you see the the, the 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 pieces of paper that land on your desk, and you see the budget, do you ever get used to seeing that figure? on a piece of paper that you are <laughs> responsible for. As you can imagine, we had a lot of people involved with this movie who have been involved with some of the biggest and the best movies for the past 30 years. Yeah. And everybody was shocked about dimensions of the movie <laughs> on that level, whether it be budget size or crew size or the scope of our sets. It was, it was shocking all around. Okay, so there's one thing making an independent film, but there's another thing making what they call a big budget studio film, tentpole. There's a whole bunch of terms. For you as a director, for as a creative, yes, there are challenges, but what's the biggest joy for you and your brother making a movie of this scale? What, what makes you the happiest? It's definitely, I mean, look, at, at the end of the day, my brother and I always say, like, filmmaking is kind of the same from our point of view, no matter what scale we're working at. It's mm. all about just 
dreaming up what we want to do and then figuring out how to execute it. So it doesn't matter what the scale is on that level. But I think the big difference with this movie is just the audiences that you're able to reach worldwide and the fans you're able to connect with worldwide is shocking. I mean, these movies are a global phenomenon and they're connecting everybody on every continent around the world at the same time. Everyone is involved in a conversation about these movies. And that's a, yeah. really, a really inspiring thing. And, and don't you think... Don't you think that's a gift because we have so few commute? I'm so glad you said that because we have so few, you know where I'm going, communal experiences anymore. With We're living in an era with 800 channels and all of these entertainment options. The fact that your movie brought people together, I, I, there's not, there can't be nothing better for you. I mean, that's great. There's nothing better. And it is really, it's, it's such a shock when you go to a different culture that has a different political system, different issues than our, our culture does, and, and realize that that movie is connecting with people in a very powerful way. It's surprising and it's also inspiring because, again, in a fractured world, it says we, we do have tethers to one another that, that matter. Absolutely. So, yeah. More with Anthony when we come back. Back in a moment, everybody, including where you can meet him today. For years, I've been treating the Hulk like he's some kind of disease, something to get rid of. But then I start looking at him as the cure. 18 months in a gamma lab. I put the brains and the brawn together. And now look at me. Best of both worlds. Excuse me, Mr. Hulk? Yes. Can we, can we get a photo? 100% little person. Come on, step on up. Do you mind? Oh, yeah. Thanks. Say green. 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 Did you get that? That's good. Do you want to grab one with me? I'm oh, Ant-Man. No. Yeah. Another clip from Avengers Endgame. By the way, the Blu-ray is now available. And you all know me. I'm a nerd. And it has great special features. We're back with Anthony Russo, the director, co-director of Avengers Endgame and Infinity War. I, I want to... I just have to mention real quickly. Yeah. In that clip you just played, that was... Uh, the children in that clip were my son, my brother Joe's daughter, and our nephew. So oh, seriously? Oh, that. nice. I that. That was a fun day on set. Two great concepts. Spoiler alerts. I'm not going to give anything away, but just this is conceptual. I have to ask as a fan. I'm asking for Marvel fans. The, the, we see Thor and we see the Hulk very differently in this movie. Whose idea was that? You know, that's, you know, my brother and I go through a very thorough process with the writers, Steve Marcus and Chris McFeely. And um, we spend months and months in the room together thinking about where we can take the characters. And that really came out of that process, just us going... How do we surprise ourselves? How do we surprise the actors? How do we surprise the audiences? How do we push these characters into a place where th we, we never guess they go, but is very much grounded in their history and their arc? What did Chris say when you said you're going to be Puffy Thor? <laughs> he, he loved it because at, by that point, he was already th shooting Thor Ragnarok. And that has a very different tone for Thor. Very. So he was already in this zone of like, let's get crazy with Thor. So uh, this version of Thor like slipped right in. Yeah. I <laughs> I gotta ask you, I said it on this show because the show's all pop culture. When we saw Tom Holland for the first time as Spider-Man, I, I looked at nothing, I love Toby, I love Andrew. There was something, I, I just, that, that, that's some of the best casting I, I, I have seen in years. Did you know it right away when Tom, uh, when, when you saw the audition tapes of screen tests? Yeah, as you can imagine, it was an extremely thorough and exhaustive casting process to cast that character because of the pressure on that character. And uh, we went through, we ended up testing several actors with Robert Downey Jr. Um, because we were introducing that character in Civil War and he had a, his primary storyline was with Tony Stark, Robert's character. Um, so yeah, but no, we knew it, we did know it right away once we got to that final testing process. Um, and look, the thing that makes Peter Parker unique among the spectrum of Marvel heroes, especially when you're looking at him in, in the context of an Avenger movie, is the fact that he's a teenager. He's a kid. Mm -hmm. And we really wanted to run at that idea. Because we can all relate name. to that. Yeah. We can all relate to aspects of Peter Parker's life. We don't have to be a web slinger. We can, that's, yeah. No, it's, it's, a, it's a very, it's a coming, it's an awkward oh, coming yeah, of yeah. age. <laughs> it's, it's, 
<laughs> it's the awkward coming of age issues that we all have to deal with in different ways as metaphor, yeah. Uh, I'm going to tell you in a minute where, where you can meet Anthony. Let's talk about uh, Robert Downey Jr. for a second. Are there days when you're looking at dailies or you're, you're, looking, you're looking in the monitor and you just go, this guy's just amazing. I mean, you're just taken away by how good he is. Yeah. All the time, all the time, Robert is one is is the hardest working actor we've ever worked with. He's focused. He, he it's he's an am amazing collaborator. Um, my brother and I rely on him a lot as we sort of, work, you know, because Joe and I work as a team. We're very into the process of collaboration and movie making. So we're very open to all the collaborators, the actors, the cinematographer, etc. And Robert has been a, one of our cornerstone collaborators over the past three movies. And I will always I always think back on early in his career. Robert Altman once said that he was the best actor of his generation, and I really believe that you can still say that about Absolutely. Him. Absolutely. Who, who in a, we have just a minute or two left. Who in the best way possible surprised you? Meaning, like, you had, a, you had a perception of what they would be like, and then they come on set, and they delighted you in a way that, you, that was unexpected. Who, who is that for you? You know, there's so many. You know, because, again, these are all phenomenal actors, right? So the characters that they craft for the screen are freak, while they're based in sort of personal things for them, they're quite different and distinct from them as people. So they all kind of shock you on that level. Um, but I would say Anthony Mackie is perhaps the most different because he plays the character Falcon. He has a very sort of, a little more focus and, and somberness on screen and seriousness. Um, but he is the craziest joker behind the scenes. Really? Ever, oh my God. He walks onto a set and everybody just starts cracking up. You, you hear him coming a mile away. He's really funny. We have about 30 seconds. I was a asking Anthony during the commercial break, the, the Blu-ray's out. Uh, just as a nerd, I'm always curious, how much say do you get over what's, what we get in a Blu-ray as the director? Oh, yeah. Uh, we, we participate very uh, intensely in that process. We work with our editor to uh, come up with the final versions of the deleted scenes. We work with Marvel and Disney to come up with the special features. Yeah. Well, I got to tell you, I, on behalf... On behalf of every fan that's watching and jealous that I get to ask you questions, I just want to thank you for taking great care of characters that we love. I mean, you, you did such an astounding job, so thank you so much. That, that means a lot. Thank yeah. you for saying you that. Really thank you. Yeah, you really that. did. Yeah, you really did. Give it up for Anthony, everybody, once thank again. You, you can meet Anthony. Here we go. You can meet Anthony right down the road from where we are at the Best Buy in Eden Prairie at 1230. Y'all got time after the show. <laughs> uh, and the Blu-ray uh, for Avengers Endgame is available now. It's also on stream. I got it on Apple TV, and I love it. We'll be right back with our remaining minutes after this. Thank you, my friend, so much. What a pleasure. Thank you. remaining minutes we wanted to come into the audience because these people are really good we love them uh how nice was anthony russo oh it was so he nice was, was in the audience he was so nice yeah he was really cool I, surprisingly like I, I shouldn't say that but you just expect when you've got that much at your fingertips that you wouldn't be that cool i know, you know? i and all of you believe me we're nerds i could have talked to him for an hour we mm -hmm. didn't have a time i had so many questions that i tried to ask a few questions that I thought you might want to know. You, but you represented the nerds very well. Thank, thank you. you. I try as a nerd. Yeah. Thank you. But again, you can meet him today at 1230 at the Best Buy Eden Prairie. I think I'm going to go down there and meet him. He's going to look at me like, yeah. didn't I just see you? Yeah, you yes. look familiar. You look really familiar, TV I was boy. I also surprised by Elle Winter. She, it was like her and her mom. That was so sweet. She just uh, was like, you know, again. no big fan tirage. She just was great. Again, I mean it. I don't just say it to, to compliment the guest. Mm -hmm. I love that. I don't care how old somebody is. When they have a dream and they follow it. You know right. what I mean? That's yep. that's because some people give up on it for because of obstacles. I, I think it's great yeah. that she did it. Good yeah. on her. Hey, by the way, uh, we, we want to meet all of you at the Minnesota State Fair. The Jason Show will be live every weekday except for Labor Day. Come down and see us right there at the Fox 9 Pavilion next to the giant slide. We will be live at 10 a.m. Central. Um, every day, you do not need a ticket to the Jason Show. You just need a ticket to the State Fair. Don't go to the State Fair box office and say, Jason said you didn't need a ticket. You need a ticket to the fair, okay? <laughs> My radio show will also be there live starting at 6 a.m. as well. I'll be there 
all day, every all day. All day, girl. Tomorrow on the show, we're talking to a vet about how to get your dog to correctly walk on a leash. That's right. Need that. We need it too, yeah. But for right now, that is going to do it for us. If you're watching and you're a kid that's being bullied, you go out there and be yourself because nobody can tell you you're doing it wrong. Have a great day, everybody. We'll see you tomorrow.